we have about 30 minutes, so I, I cannot go beyond 12.30. So I just want to um, ask those, I'm gonna allow everyone to ask their questions, but just to reiterate that the questions, if we can keep them uh, short and to the point so we can get as many questions in. Um, also, if you could say exactly which panel member your question is to, I think that would be really helpful. Um, I will ask the officers for support in terms of uh, letting me know whose hands is up and if there's any questions in the chat. Yes, hi, Councillor uh, Williams. Um, Councillor Lacau would like to ask a question and uh, then Councillor Anne-Marie Williams. So uh, if I can ask my colleagues to unmute Councillor Lacau. Councillor Lacau and then uh, Councillor Anne-Marie Cousins. Well, we both happen to be in the same place, so that's great. Thank you very much, and I'd really like to thank the panel. It's a very interesting discussion. Um, for me, I would be starting with a question, and it's to, to the panelists, wh whoever wants to pick this up, is until we understand that um, race as a concept is a political entity in itself, and therefore it's about creating a hierarchy, it's about power relations, um, and that's why when we are talking about the hierarchy of, of race, it's very difficult not to see how that, that term is used to continually um, perpetuate um, discrimination because by the very nature of the concept, it is hierarchical. Thank you. Does anyone want to pick that up or should I? Should I, um, I'm gonna ask Caroline Ukamuni to pick that up and then if anyone else wants to come in, I think that would be helpful. Hi Isis, that's, that's a tricky one because at the end I was thinking, what's the question? Um, yes, race is hierarchical. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure whether, whether I, I will just expand on that a, a little bit, if I may, but by saying that race is hierarchical, but race is not separate from gender and class and sexuality. So we have hierarchies within that racial structure. I'm not sure if the question was leading towards the idea of how do we deconstruct within institutional practices racism if race is hierarchical? Can I answer that question? Um, I would say that that is one of the reasons that I am wondering, and you know, when you were talking, Chancellor Williams, I was wondering whether we should start thinking about having black teacher training colleges for black men and black women. The reason I make this point is that within a Eurocentric system, which is systemically and structurally racist, which is structured by racial hierarchy, it will be a very long time, I think, before we will ever reach the point of being able to equalize um, racial race, will equalize races and achieve racial equality. The danger, I think, in waiting for that point is that before that can occur, I believe that we have to have a fundamental overhaul of the political social and economic structures in which we are located. Um, so that's my response to the problems that are initiated by racial hierarchy. Uh, thank you. Did any of the other speaker want to come in quickly before I move on to the next um, uh, question, please? I think that there is, um there is a lot of work to do. I'd um, add to what Caroline's saying in terms of, you know, making sure that what is it that stops um, for education? What is it that stops teachers going for senior leadership positions? What blocks them from actually getting the um, positions? And how do we ensure that people with potential, which we know the talent is out there, we, we know that it's very diverse that it is in the schools but there is something there is something stopping people from actually going for those senior leadership um, positions and those roles and we have to look at how you know when we're interviewing the panels 
you know, the language that we're speaking, how can we be more inclusive and actually so that people actually realize that it is a real benefit. And when I say that it is a real benefit in having a diverse range of people in your, um, in your school, in the workplace. And I think that until we, and that's why I said earlier about those uncomfortable conversations, you know, in Greenwich, we are having those conversations. We've got a Black Lives Matter group with um, Florence Kroll leading um, from, you know, the director of education and head teachers to look at how can we be more inclusive and how do we nurture the talent that is out there and how do we spot the talent and how do we stop employing everybody that looks the same as us. So if I'm a head teacher, I want to have, you know, male teachers. I haven't got a lot of them. I do want more male teachers in my school. You know, how do I make sure that I've got a diverse range, not only gender, sexuality, race as well. I need to make sure that we're looking at how we actually spot that talent and build those relationships and those structures with those staff members so that they are equipped when they go for those interviews, that they can get those jobs. Because I think there's a lot of things that stop people from actually going for those roles. And it's not through lack of talent. It really isn't. Can I come back up with that? Because there's a question in the chat there, which I think is, uh, I will pitch this one uh, back to you actually, um, uh, Martha. Mm -hmm. Why are black teachers leaving the profession? Because I think it ties in right nicely with what you just ended with. Well, I, I really want to expand on that. Why are teachers lead, leaving the profession? Because I think it's teachers are leaving the profession. We know that and one of the, thing, one of the challenges for all schools is how do you um, keep hold of talent? You want talent to be able to move on. You don't want to just hold on to people, but I think that there is something around the education system um, in terms of people leaving the prof profession. And I think that that's, it's not just black teachers. I think the experience of black teachers will be different, but I think it's um, something that has been happening for quite a while that teachers are leaving the profession. Now, I can't speak for everybody and I don't want to speak for um, all black teachers. I can speak from my experiences and I want to be really clear about that. But sometimes people might be disheartened that they may have been in the profession for years and they've seen other people, um, you know, moving into more senior roles. I think that there's something around what you believe in. You know, if you're in a place that you actually believe in the ethos of the school, that, those are things that were important for me. But I think that there needs to be, there's something around sharing the experiences. My experiences are very unique for me to be in this position. And I feel that it is a real privilege for me to be a head teacher. And you may say, why should it be a pri privilege? And I think because it's such an amazing job that, you know, one of the best jobs I've ever had. Challenging, hard, difficult, but I love it. But, I, you know, wouldn't it be great if there's more people looking like me being head teachers you know if someone had piercings or blonde hair and you know didn't feel that they wouldn't get the job you know I think it's really important that we have a diverse range of staff in schools for everyone you know this is for everyone this is about the teachers it's about the community this is about the children it, it works it works thank you that's uh, really good um, Councillor Cousins if I bring you in for your question and do let me know if it's a specific to a, a panel member. Thank you. Councillor, yeah. Yes, I hope that I'm unmuted now. Thank you. Okay, what I wanted to ask, I don't really think it's directed to a specific panel member, although I thank all of them for their time because I understand they donated the time and these discussions need, need to be had. I want to thank Councillor or the Cabinet Member Adele for arranging this because I think it's a brave step. What I wanted to ask is about the language that we are using. Terms such as people of colour, BAME, I have no idea what ethnicity that is. And to me, it adds to the problem. It, it adds to the invisibility. It adds to the discrimination. And I also feel that there sometimes is a reluctance 
to share the struggles that individuals uh, um, have to go through to achieve whatever attainments they've achieved. So that probably will cover quite a few panel members. Thank you. Okay, I will bring in uh, Caroline, then Jason. Caroline? Thank you, Chancellor Williams. Um, yeah, it's a very distressing experience sometimes when we look back on our history and we see how long it has taken to make very, take very small steps and to make gains. And one of the problems also with historical change is that you can take one step forward and two steps backward. You know, you're const it's like a game of historical snakes and ladders. And I think that that can be disheartening. That being said, however, I think that as we are progressing and developing in our experience, we are, you know, um, starting, I mean, maybe, I'm African, my parents are Nigerian. I'm very, very clear about that. But I do think for many people, particularly in the African diaspora, actually being able to say, we are African people, this is where we came from, this is our historical experience and our heritage, it's something that we have become very uncomfortable with because our journey into the West has taught us to despise that history and identity. So I, I'm in agreement with the, the person who asked the question. Fame is not always helpful for me. It doesn't describe my identity. It's a political term which, I mean, 10 years ago I was BME. I think 10 years before that I was black. You know, I'm anticipating in a five year time, I'm going to be a person of color. So I'm kind of being battered around on this sea of, of meaning and terminology. But essentially, I think the question is not to wait for other people to name you, but for us to start thinking about how we want to name ourselves and what that means. And again, I will come back to the issue of historical subjectivity. That will all depend on us developing our consciousnesses to decide who we think we are and where we want to be going. I hope that answers the question. That was well put together. Well, Thank very you. well, very well said. Jason, um, if you could um, tackle that one as well, please. I, I was gonna say, Caroline said it so eloquently. I don't think there's much more to add to that, but I guess what I would say is that um, I, I think the uncomfortability um, has also um, created a lot of infighting and I guess there's a feeling that there's a there's a kind of dipping in and dipping out um, type of political blackness and kind of people kind of shed that as a almost like a coat as in when it pleases them um, and I guess within that we do have to acknowledge anti-black um, discourses um, that happen within ethnic minorities and, and, and they do exist and I guess um, you know the neutralizing of that of that discourse comes when we do kind of really proliferate widely terms like BAME and it's important that we don't kind of get into that habit of kind of looking at this as one homogeneous group I guess for auditing and government policy and purposes and things like that obviously it's used widely um, and there isn't really a, a term that could be put in its place but I think when we kind of fall into the trap of BAME I think we can look at misleading figures and a lot of the figures can be quite misleading because it's looked at as one kind of homogeneous group and I do think that you know black people do make up three percent of the UK population um, and that is a very very small percentage and their outcomes are still significantly worse than other ethnic minorities and i do think that for whatever reason we kind of suppress that as as a as a point of discussion and, and we do need to think about how we have that discussion um I, I think we need to get comfortable with the uncomfortable i think that is a conversation that needs to be had because the outcomes are getting the, the chasm is getting wider so it's not even something you can continue to neutralize or, or stifle it is actually getting wider in terms of employment outcomes, um, housing outcomes, um, educational outcomes, those chasms are not actually closing. And I think it's important to acknowledge the differences um, and really, I guess, examine why those differences may occur. And I think using terms like BAME 
are not particularly helpful in doing that. I guess the other side of it, in terms of kind of, I guess I always think of like the idea of twitching fingers and twitching fingers and being a collective fist are two different things. And I guess what, you know, people of colour, fame, political blackness represents is a collective. And I would always argue that the collective is a more powerful instrument in dismantling, you know, structural and institutional racism than it being a sum of its parts. So I think it's important, but I guess to also caveat that, I think there has been a dipping in and out of political blackness that has also resided within anti-blackness, generally speaking. And we need to have more of those discussions because I think for black people, um, they don't have that luxury of kind of checking into the Hotel California and leaving any time they like. Once you're in, you're in, <laughs> you know, and I think maybe other kind of ethnic minorities do have that luxury of not being black in that, in that state. They may be politically black, but in terms, there is an actual visual and visceral difference that isn't lost within the guise of clone, it isn't lost within the colonial guise. And I think that's important to acknowledge and it, it discredits our abhorrent histories in terms of the treatment of black people to not acknowledge that. Thank you. It's, it's, it's so good that we're having such open and honest conversation. And I think um, this is what the Black History Month 365 should be about is uh, not just restricting it to October, but having uh, a whole year or um, even beyond where we can have this conversation. And the more we have this conversation, the more it becomes part of the norm. Um, it's about acknowledging um, things when they're not going right and finding ways to fix it. Um, so these discussions are really uh, helpful. We've got a couple more. I'm going to invite those who have put their questions on the chat. I'm going to invite you to uh, put your questions forward. So I've got a representative from B Young Star and then I've got Eleanor. So B Young Star, I'm not sure if it's Abdi. Abdi, if you're there, if you could um, ask your questions, please and say please to which panel member. Um, hello everybody, thank you for your, for your time. It's been very informative and my first time being in these kind of discussions and panels. Does anyone can hear me? Yeah. Yeah, my, my question is to uh, panel is, do we have a platform for young people to discuss issues regarding uh, racial problems in schools. Um, for example, if a young person wants to disclose something privately outside the school arena to say a community organization or, or a youth club or something like that, that is anonymous. So they don't have to feel like they got that pride of, you know, disclosing that information. Okay. So if they get victimized in school in terms of racial bias, whether it's a teacher, whether it's a, you know, school staff or, you know what I mean? Okay. I'm going to throw this one out again to Martha, uh, given that she's in a school in, in Greenwich. Um, Martha, do you mind picking that up? I hope you'll be able to. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can only speak on behalf of um, a primary school, which is, much younger children um, in terms of you know racial incidences you know they do happen they do take place in schools and you know we had one not too long ago and you know it was a real curveball and a learning curve for us because we haven't had any racial instances for quite a long time and you know in terms of what we do um, we speak to the children speak to the parents with regards to um, any racial comments or um, anything um, of that sort. And then we um, actually put something in place for the victim and for the, per the perpetrator as well. But I don't know, in terms of the education system, we would hope that children would be able to speak to adults with regards to that. But I don't know of anything outside um, that children would go to in terms of that. Secondary school, I can't really speak for secondary schools with regards to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Abdi, I'm going to invite you to email me your questions because I'd like to find out from Children's Services and, and, and send that back to you. So if you don't mind, drop me a line and we'll pick that up 
offline. Uh, Eleanor, can I invite you to um, make your comment or uh, put forward your question, please? Bernard, if you're finding it difficult to locate her, um, I Okay. Yes, I'm, 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 I'm trying to unmute, ask to unmute. Um, Peter has oh. that, oh, I'm afraid to say mute and mute. Um, oh, but I have sent that request. To oh, she's unmuted now. Thank okay. you. Go, Eleanor. Hello. I think my question is because it made me reflect that I've been listening uh, all morning and I've not heard mention that anybody speak about disabled black students. I've had conversations with a few, and as you can imagine, uh, there are even more barriers when you are disabled and black. So I'm just wondering if the panel has sort of any um, comments on that, and what does Greenwich do um, to have representation of disabled teachers? I've um, spoken also to a a BAME um, a teacher training person who says that she's having problems with finding placements for herself. Um, so it's, a, it's double pronged. Those who are trying to train as disabled teachers and disabled students, black students, who are trying to find um, role models, who are trying to find people who represent themselves so yeah that's my question thank, thank you. you and i'm going to open this up to any panel member that want to um respond yeah i mean i can say um that uh at kent well as part of the decolonizing the curriculum project one of the themes that emerged from the students um was disability and in particular in relation to um the experiences of students going to um, seek support and there being very not that there wasn't support but it just they felt that you know it kind of very much compounded racialization that they were experiencing that they weren't being listened to and heard properly um, and actually it's one of the areas where we worked with the services to really you know listen and take on board what the students were saying to them and that they've they've actually worked really hard to you know change their culture change their practices change their policies including actually which relates to an earlier question reporting um of uh incidences of racism or you know racialization and that is one of the areas that has actually been you know quote unquote more successful in terms of implementation so i think there is definitely a lot that can be can be done and addressed in that area thank you very much dr jivra uh Mut mutami muta him sorry if, if i pronounced your name incorrectly um would you ask your question i'm happy to read them out but then i think mem um, members of the audience would like to speak as well so if i invite you to ask your question please no problem uh, just, uh thank you very much that's very interesting thought all throughout the morning and uh, very interesting discussion so my question just really is to all of you uh you've mentioned so many different interesting things historically sociologically legally and so on how do we build solidarity cooperation and raising consciousness without a, a decidedly left-wing political vocabulary Is that to any member or in particular? To everyone mm -hmm. on the panel. They've all said very equally interesting things. And I'm very struck by the language used, the terminology used, uh, the historical references made from IET to you know, today, Black Lives Matter. Uh, my, my question is simply, well, how, how do we build solidarity, cooperation, raise consciousness without a decidedly political, uh, left-wing political vocabulary. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, panel members, I will call. Um, if no one is ready, I'll just call on someone. Anyone want to? I'll give it a go. 
<laughs> okay, okay. Go for it. <laughs> Sorry, Martha, did you want to speak? If you want to, no, please, you go like, first. <laughs> no, no, Martha, please, please. Yeah, everyone wants to get their teeth into this one. <laughs> I think, so one of the things that I'm, when, when you pose that question, I'm thinking about, is it, are you talking about the language that we're using that doesn't, that uh, actually allows us all to actually speak? Or are you saying that the, because language is really important. I mean, I mean what Caroline was saying about how, you know, um, you know, the BAME, we can use BAME, black ethnic minorities, there's so many different terminologies, but in terms of language, it's got to be a language that is inclusive. And I think I said it earlier and I'll say it again, we've got to get uncomfortable around that in terms of that. And it's about us equip equipping young people to be able to talk about these challenging situations and have the language to do so. And the more we do that, the more, confident people are able to express how they they feel i don't know if that's answering your question can i say something yeah yeah, yeah. sorry it's me i'm back in the room <laughs> i kind of feel like you know i find this question really funny because i've never read marx i'm never going to read marx i don't know what socialism is apart from african socialism and that doesn't really count but I think that one of the things that strikes me is that whenever people talk about certain issues such as race, it seems that it has become an ideological issue. If you believe that racism exists, it means that you're a Marxist or you're left wing or you're some kind of nutter. And if you deny that racism exists and that people somehow are not able to achieve the best that they can in life, it's because, you know, you're kind of adopting an ideological position, which is a conservative intellectual position. My position on this is maybe I use certain kinds of language, we're academics, we're intellectuals, we have a kind of discourse which we all engage with, which is boring, I must admit, and irritating for the average person. I'm going to be the first person to admit that. But I don't think we should confuse the language with the message. The issue is one of our common humanity. It's one of, as I said earlier, it's one where I don't want to live in a world where there is violence. I don't want to live in a world where people are colonized by other people, either as individuals or as nations or as communities. I do want to live in a world where the world's resources are more equitably distributed and are there for many, many generations of us to enjoy. Um, I don't think that's a left-wing agenda. I, I would argue that's a human agenda. Thank you. Jason, did you wanna come back in? Hello? Okay, yeah, I was just going to say it's a, it's a pretty difficult question. I mean, um, I do think there's a way of engaging people um, which requires a tolerance and a patience and a, and a language that, that allows people to be seen and be heard. Now, obviously what we see and what we hear are not always things we may want to hear, but the, the whole point of having free speech and difference of opinion is that that is what it is. People have differences of opinion. I think what we need to move towards is people, particularly those on the right, and I would, I would say that, um, being more susceptible and open to, to engaging with a different way of thinking that is more inclusive. And actually, maybe by um, thinking about how we steer particular things, that becomes really important. So. I guess, like I said, it's a dance, right? It's a, it's a kind of language. It's that whole idea of how can these types of movements be inclusionary? Because there are probably aspects of the left to people on the right that may seem exclusionary. So I'm not saying by any means I'm a centrist, but what I am saying is that there's probably a way that maybe as a society we need to continue to refine and devise how we bring, we make sure that we listen to what people are saying but we look at something that is actually for the greater good. And I would always advocate and advance that, you know, greater equality, greater diversity, greater access to opportunity is to the benefit of everyone. Um, and if a, if, if a structure like racism impedes all of those things, then that's a conversation that we need to have in a really constructive way but to do that it means that as my dad would say you've got two ears and one mouth for a reason and i think sometimes 
you don't do enough listening and it's not anything that I hear that I like to listen to but actually the act of just listening in itself allows people to feel as though they're being heard and then the counter to that can be to correct or to provide them with the education that may be the better education to have and then they have the choice but I guess if we kind of move towards this idea that we're forcing the choice on people anytime you force something on people whether it's good or bad is inherently going to be some sort of resistance so I think maybe it's about how we do this dance differently because I mean now you're putting the word radical before before the left you know one you know 10 years ago I never heard I hadn't heard that term the radical left you know you heard the radical right but you never heard the radical left and it's kind of like almost now the left are being brought into that idea of well they're just as bad as the right and obviously objectively and subjectively I would argue that's that's incorrect but it's that whole thing of finding a language where we all are able to listen to one but another. isn't that part of the reason why racism is re-articulated every so often uh, the limits of my language are the limits of my world so said Wittgenstein yeah if you want to historically contextualize all the things that have been mentioned today I don't I think it's very important to have you know a, a language which is it shouldn't be kind of dismissed or analyzed in a way that's inclusive or exclusive if you look at from the civil rights movement how did that consciousness grow amongst young people young black men particularly who were being killed in the Vietnam War when they come back they're unemployed yeah they've got poor housing that raised consciousness in a different way popular culture music and the language of being black in America in the 60s does have nodal points it's not all over the place it has very particular points of agreement the same is happening in this country i'm sure all the academics here you're all familiar with stuart hall's work and the ever moving right show well isn't part of all of this discussion to be framed within that context since 1979 and the rise of thatcherism we've been mirroring america in all the most horrific ways you mentioned yourself jason earlier about from classroom to prison again if you have a political vocabulary that is able to explain that historically and contextualize it both economically and politically because i know caroline says she's not going to read marx but i would no. ar urge you to read a little bit of marx because no I think sweetheart i'm too old for that no, you're never too old to read marx it does help to situate where we are today because if i look at the main kind of political actors with any power, especially in the Conservative Party, they're very right wing. I don't know what message that sends to young black people. Yeah. And that is because systematically, let, 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 let me be honest, power has many disguises. Power is not just about militarism or colonialism. Power has many disguises and race and class are like hand and glove. It goes through the education system, policing, everywhere. So when you look at that, that's why I was posing the question, just to kind of get you to, you know, just to see what you think. Because I think a political vocabulary, which is about commonality, solidarity, and advancing the vast majority of people's interests, is always something that's systematically attacked. Thank you very much. True. I, I guess Are you coming back that, on that, Jason, or because I was going to move it on? Are you coming back no, on that? No, no, okay. No, so I, I think Mahim makes a fantastic point, and yeah. we'll leave it on that. Sorry. <laughs> All right. I'm um, continue to put the comments in. I'm just going to take one last question bec because of time. So, Carmel, I've not met you. Good to meet you virtually. Um, if you would you like to share your question, and probably to say to which speaker, please. Thank you so much, um, Councillor Williams. First, can I just say thank you to all the speakers? It's been a fantastic discussion. I've loved hearing everything everyone has to say. Um, my question really is because Jason brought up um, some points around the fact that a lot of children are struggling to see themselves represented in the curriculum and also he mentioned the fact about um, that lack of sense of belonging within educational system and that this is contributing to the widening of the attainment gap for a lot of children and also the exclusion rates and the prison to pipeline um school to prison pipeline and all these other things so my question really was to the panel how do they feel that mainstream education could best work with the community sector, so the voluntary sector, youth provisions and supplementary school to best reduce this attainment gap and um, do something to redress this 
imbalance, I suppose, within mainstream education. And also, um, our experience is that most universities tend to engage with the older cohorts. So how can we encourage universities to start engaging with pupils from a much younger age? So from primary school rather than upper secondary school. Can I um, speak um, about my thoughts um, around that question? I think that there's something really fundamental to what we're doing today and to your question with how we can engage more with the voluntary groups, the supplementary schools and that to make a difference. There's something missing from this panel today and that's young people. I think that it's, we have got to be, get into the room and speak to the young people and speak about their experience, let them speak about their experiences because as academics, we're making decisions, we're talking about our experiences, about, you know, about what the data sh shows, um, but we haven't got the young people in the room. And I think that until we have these conversations with young people and really give them a platform to listen to what is it like being in a secondary school? What is your experience like being um, a black boy in the school? What is your experience like being a black girl in the school? Until we get them in the room and ask them what will help and what will make a difference, it's very easy for us to make decisions and judgments. So I think in terms of strengthening those things, it has to be young people have to be part of this. And I think that that would really make a difference. And it's something that I really am pushing for that we engage more with the young people. Thank you very much. Well, that is so important. Um, um, and it's good that you've actually said that because when, when I saw the lineup of the panel, I was thinking it'd be good to hear from young people um, and every, uh, so often we forget that most times we're talking about the future and the future is our young people. So we need to hear directly from them. Hopefully, uh, if we have another session like this, we can bring some young people back and then they can share. But it's, it's been really great. Unfortunately, um, I know I've gone 10 minutes over time. So apologies to uh, Denise and Adele. Um, and the rest of the officers if I've gone over time, but it's been a really, really good discussion. Uh, thank you all for your contribution. If anyone has questions that I haven't covered because I've missed it in the chat, I do apologize, but I'll go through and if there's anything that we need to uh, maybe send to any of the speaker to get their thoughts on, I will see if we can do that. Um, but just want to thank you again for your time and your patience and your uh, contribution. I hope you, I know that Adele said it'll be excited, but I think these are sometimes uncomfortable conversations. I do hope you have enjoyed it. Uh, there's an email address in the chat where you can send uh, comments, contribution uh, to. So do take note of that. Um, thank you very much. I think, sorry, come, sorry. I'm just saying thank you to everybody and thank you, Ivis, for um, hosting as well. It's been really brilliant. Thank okay. you. I hope you all enjoy it and uh, hopefully we can go away with all the, um, you know, put together some action points uh, to see how we can make the Black History Month 365 uh, more successful, but um, getting the message out there so that uh, our voices are heard and there will be some changes in the system.